Hi everyone. Oh, there we go. Hi everyone. Welcome to the GoGN webinar for November. Um, I'm Rob. Today we're focusing on our research fellowships, the third wave. Um, and I'm going to hand you over to our fellowship coordinator, Paco, to get things started. Paco. Thank you very much, Rob, and hello everyone. I'm going to share my screen now. Okay, so just to um, introduce briefly the scheme, which is just uh, finishing. Um, the idea of this uh, scheme was to support all those GoGN alumni uh, just after finishing their PhD. So when we launched the first call, we we're thinking uh, about two main areas. So thinking about the possibility to undertake a piece of research, which was focused on OERP and most likely joined to the PSD, as well consider an overview of uh, OER activity in a particular region, mostly because of the promotion of GoGN, uh, conferences and online events. And uh, then we realized after uh, having discussion with the uh, alumni proposing and then with fellows, uh, the possibility to bring our ideas, our own proposals, and that has enriched the scheme a lot. And the outputs uh, in general terms were uh, regular uh, reports back to the network at the beginning and midterm at the end, but the contact, uh, fluent contact via email, uh, three block uh, inputs, uh, which are available in the GoGM website, uh, and a production of an output review report at the end of the fellowship, which basically has created the the report and is a core part of the report. The first cohort was uh, between October 2020 and March 2021 with Joe, Virginia, and Judith and Chrissy, uh, different proposals about uh, open educational practices in cultural learning and work, uh, workforce cap uh, capabilities in Australia. Then Virginia focused in, uh, on Uruguay during uh, pandemic times with K-12 students and teachers. Then Judith, uh, did her research uh, mostly in terms of uh, recruitment of GoGM members and dissemination in Africa. Chrissy uh, and team produced a together picture book. The second court was run between May 21 and December 21. In this case, two fellows, Birina and Sarah. So Birina proposed a project uh, about podcasting and Sarah was working uh, around equity, inclusion and Australian open educational practices. The third court uh, was launched in February and uh, run until last July. And uh, we got Michael, PPN, and Catherine. Uh, Michael was working about the principles of education to introduce future teachers to the practice of openness. Uh, PPN had the focus on Brazilian public school teachers and the impact of uh, OER during COVID 19. And Catherine uh, proposed the Just Knowledge project. A total of nine fellowships. All the info is available there. We'll share the link soon. And uh, what's gonna happen now? After this short welcome, just uh, remembering the fabulous nine fellows we got in the scheme, we're gonna have a conversation uh, with Bibian, with Catherine and Michael, and then we can discuss with all uh, the audience present here. Uh, later, and these times are just an estimation, we're gonna be launching officially the report, uh, the recordings from uh, all, uh, all those interviews we had with the fellows during last summer, so let's just start with the fun. I welcome Vivian, Catherine, and Michael. Uh, we now we will have a short presentation from each of them introducing their fellowship. Vivian, please, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, well, this slide basically summarizes uh, the, the final findings of my study, but uh, just to go back a little bit, uh, when I started out this fellowship, I wanted to investigate whether teachers who had been uh, public school teachers in Brazil who had been uh, previously trained on the use of OER uh, did indeed engage in these practices during emergency remote uh, teaching uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, so basically my methodology was to first uh, recruit these teachers. Um, I started out uh, trying to get 15 on board and unfortunately I ended up only with five uh, teachers. Um, then I carried out interviews uh, with each of these teachers and I found out really interesting things. Uh, my questions were not only focused on whether they, ha they had used OER, and yes, most of them had because 
One thing the pandemic, oh, I think one of the positive aspects of the COVID pandemic is at the beginning, uh, they were like, they, would, they didn't receive any instructions from the federal government or from the Ministry of Education of what they should be doing uh, during the time when everything was closed and schools were all closed. The school stayed closed in Brazil for about a year and a half until um, June of 2021. So it was a very long time. Uh, and depending on where they lived, they had support of, from the state government um, and sometimes from the municipal government as well. So if you go more to the southern part of Brazil, uh, which is more advanced in terms of um, education and, and technology use and all of that, um, the, the state government was kind of directing the teacher as well, you know, start using Google Classroom and, and other apps like that. But then one of the teachers who I interviewed was uh, lives way up in, in the northern part in, in, in the Amazon River. And like these teachers had no training on how to use technology, they didn't have technology. So they ended using WhatsApp to communicate and teach other teachers. And then uh, since they had this kind of time between you know, st starting to, to engage with their students and not, uh, they spent their time catching up and doing course. So there was this course uh, that, have, that have been already three years uh, been delivering absolutely for free on OER. And these teachers went after that. And so they took part in, in this course and they learned about OER. And that was very interesting because it was their own initiative. And so they did indeed end up using OER and um, also they did engage in OEPs um, to a less extent because um, they were trying to communicate with other teachers more on what they should be doing as far as uh, technologies and helping other teachers and a little less on exchanging um, pedagogical practices and things like that. Uh, so the first step or the first phase of, of my research was to focus on what happened, the challenges they face, um, just getting, you know, their demographics, uh, what were the pedagogies they used, uh, how did they use OER, if they did engage in OEPs, uh, among many other things which you can find on my blog there. Um, and finally, if they intended to use uh, OER once they got back to the face-to-face -face classrooms, which happened uh, circa June, July of 2021, which is when they went back to face-to-face uh, -face teaching. Uh, and the second phase of my study, uh, I basically conducted a, a focus groups and these uh, focus groups um, with all of them, um, they were aimed at first um, having then do a member checking, you know, to, to really validate this data that I had collected because um, the first interviews uh, gave me a lot of, of data to analyze. And then I wanted to validate it with them and see whether they had anything to, to further add to this data that I had collected and analyzed, okay? So based on that, I triangulated all the data. I used NVivo to do that, so it was a qualitative uh, analysis. And uh, so I came up with these guidelines, okay, um, which are based on, uh, you know, collaborative work focused on uh, the times of crisis and our hybrid learning. And I think that Brazil, uh, like many countries, is now more prepared to go on to hybrid learning. Of course, we're in the transition of a new government. Uh, we know that this government, uh, this new government that is taking on is much more focused uh, on education because the last government was not focused on education at all. They destroyed everything we had constructed until um, this period. So these were, we were back in the middle ages during these past four years, okay? Uh, so this shines light, um, so these guidelines um, a lot of these guidelines, I'm not going to go over each and every one of them because um, they're up in the blog post, but just to show you guys, um, a lot of this uh, resonated very deeply 
um, with my dissertation, my doctoral dissertation, because I had already been kind of investigating that. So when I saw the data came out, and also having validated that these teachers already knew what OER uh, were, um, it made me kind of, um, gave me, you know, a sense of kind of satisfaction to see that, yeah, if you train teachers, they will go on and adopt it. Of course, one thing I noticed was they were, some of them were creating OER from scratch, but there is still a big problem, which is the use of uh, the, the OER licenses, okay? Um, none of them were focused on OER license. They would need more training to do that kind of stuff, so um, to use the licenses correctly. Uh, but it made me happy to see, yeah, that they, they were enjoying creating this stuff. And I said, well, so now you've created this, so let's, you know, let's get this and, and let's share it, okay? So I'm just gonna go over some of the main points here. Um, so the first one says, as the use of email, mobile phones and Google class apps were used as ICTs during EIRT. Uh, this is something that came up in the, in the data that both students and teachers now feel more comfortable and confident using these technologies. It, it was really nice to hear um, one of the participants said, you know, there were, when I went in to do my doctoral dissertation and, and I, I undertook an intervention in the school, I saw that there was a lot of resistance from, especially from the older teachers uh, in regards to using ICTs uh, for teaching purposes. And now it appears that they've become more comfortable because they were kind of forced into using them one way or, what, or the other. Um, uh, so that's the first point here. Uh, digital resources in OER should be incorporated in lessons to complement traditional classes, um, which are still mainly based on the use of textbooks. And I also found out that, you know, a, it, this government was so neglectful that a lot of teachers never even received the textbooks uh, for the years of 2020, 2021. So we have a big problem on our hands right now uh, which is first, the teachers have to receive the new textbooks. Second, um, the students lost a year and a half of learning, which made them really go back. And this is showing up on national exams uh, now. Uh, digital research in the should be used creating active methodologies to foster student engagement, motivation, learning. This is also from the data because um, some of the teachers showed me these incredible activities that they were coming up with, um, which were more engaging for the students. Uh, teacher mediation to teach students how to use technology for pedagogical use continue to be crucial. Well, this is not something that we can stop here. This, uh, this is ongoing, okay? Uh, especially in a country where there are many students in the public school system who do not have access um, to any kind of internet or mobile phones, okay? This is becoming less and less now. Uh, we have the 5G implemented, which was something good that we can take out of this government. So we have more and more people. Uh, mobile phones is, is widely used in Brazil and more and more people be able to access uh, the internet. Uh, sharing of knowledge, instructional material, and innovative pedagogical practices should be encouraged by school management to achieve this school management could set Google Docs. So the, the main idea of this uh, would be uh, to build a shared centralized idea bank of whatever one school does to be shared with other schools and replicated across Brazil in different regions and different states, so on. Uh, teachers who already have experience using OER should oversee the delivery of teacher professional development programs. This, I think, is an important point because there's nothing like a teacher who has had experience to pass it on and teach it on to other teachers, you know? I think um, this is also from the idea that things are always better if they're bottom up and top down, you know? Trying to push things top down. So I think that's something that I really motivate these teachers, you know, go on and, and, and go teach other teachers what you've done here. Um, so um, teachers who participate in OER training programs then go on to using, creating, share them, should be provided with incentives. Well, 
that's also wishful thinking, but it, it's always a good idea. They do get some kind of incentives when they do participate in any kind of training, uh, but OER training programs are still fairly new. Um, this is more in the more developed states and much less in the less developed states of Brazil, okay? Uh, school OER mentors and trainers should provide clear, clear examples of OER, of how OER can be integrated into math or science class. So here I go again, and this is something that I found out um, that resonated very well with my thesis, which is this step-by-step -step learning by doing approach. Um, I think that's the best way to teach other teachers how to incorporate and use and adopt and, and eventually license OER. Uh, have OER teachers, trained teachers or teachers who have received training on OER use or keep records of best practices. I think wikis are a good thing. I, uh, one of the participants that I uh, interviewed said that she was knowledgeable, she knew how to use the wikis. So I said, hey, you know, start teaching. Uh, other teachers how to use wikis so you can share these best practices, disseminate them and, and get them across uh, the whole public school system. Uh, and then another idea here, another guideline, OER experts, on a, on a, and I consider myself an OER expert, uh, could help oversee these OER professional development programs. Um, they, and more to ensure that teachers are using and attributing CC licenses correctly, because that is something uh, that I did not uh, find in any of my findings. They were not using the CC licenses. They were, their least um, preoccupation was finding the licenses. And the, it seems to them like the licenses are so difficult, right? But they're so easy. And reflection on practices or lessons learned during the pandemic and innovations made by teachers during emergency remote teaching should be critical components of teacher professional development programs and or teachers uh, weekly meetings uh, to enable not only new ideas to bloom, but also to promote collaborative and co cooperative work in the post pandemic era. And these components could also help build a, a culture of collaboration, which is something that I found in my doctoral dissertation, uh, which is absolutely missing uh, from the public school uh, system culture. Uh, teachers do not have this culture of collaboration. As a matter of fact, I don't think the Brazilian population does as well. So <laughs> I guess it's time. Uh, we're also going to be having, uh, we have a big budget problem. Uh, so this is something now that I see the transitioning government uh, will have problems with resources and education. So I think now is a good time to be kind of showing them, you know, let's use all we are, you know, this is a way to save money, save costs, save expense, and also use this expertise uh, the teachers gained during the pandemic of trying to teach with different technologies and using different pedagogies than they were used to face-to-face. -face. So that basically summarizes my, uh, my presentation here, my slide. Thank you, Beep. Thank you very much. Now we welcome Catherine. We are aware you have problems with your voice, so please uh, bear in mind. Thank you. Thank you, Paco. Um, Hi, everyone, and apologies. I'm just uh, recovering from a bit of a, one of these nasty um, winter bugs here in Ireland. And uh, so I'm just going to keep this fairly short because I don't have much of a voice. Um, as it says on the slide here, the name of my project uh, for the Gojian Fellowship was Just Knowledge. And basically, I, I embarked on the project, unlike Vivian um, and perhaps Michael, we'll, we'll hear from, more from Michael in a moment. Um, this was not work that was already in train when I applied for the fellowship. It was just a kind of germ of an idea, which was that I've been working for, you know, many years in the area of open educational practices in the higher education sector. Um, and I felt that um, it, it, there might be an opportunity to partner with people in the community sector around opening knowledge and supporting their open knowledge practices. Um, and particularly, you know, in a time where resources are so constrained um, for community organizations, which are often, you know, the lifeblood of their communities. 
and in a post-pandemic, so-called post-pandemic context where, you know, many more organizations, including community organizations, are sharing information digitally, it seemed like a good moment um, to try and, and, and see about that premise. So I called it just knowledge rather than open knowledge um, because I didn't want to lead in with assuming that opening the knowledge would be the best thing to do. Um, I, I said, I stated the three core ideals of the project were justice, equity, and openness. And I very much used the seven principles of data feminism from Dignazio and Klein, um, which I know many of you are familiar with, um, as, a, as a way of kind of sharing my values of the project. And that ended up being, um, you know, a great way to build trust and um, establish relationships with the community organizations. So those seven principles are things like examine power, challenge power, elevate emotion and embodiment, uh, rethink binaries, uh, embrace pluralism, consider context and make labor visible. So, you know, by, go, by going in and saying these were the base values of the project, how did they meet the, the, the values of the organization and how could, might we work together? Um, that was a good approach. So um, after uh, several invitations, I found three community organizations that um, were willing to work together. The timing had to be right. Um, there had to be a resource within the, that organization who had the time and the space to, to work with me. So it wasn't straightforward to find the partners, but I found them. Um, the Galway Traveler Movement is a, is a, is a human rights anti-racist organization that supports travelers, um, traveling people um, in Ireland and specifically in Galway. And they had developed um, a physical map of traditional traveler campsites. And I helped them to develop a digital map um, from that physical map. Um, and so the artifact of the digital map was important, but really what was the work that we did together was around things like understanding, you know, what does it mean to make something open, privacy, um, get, getting permission to share stories, photographs, audio recordings, those kinds of things. So it was a very generative project and I'm continuing to work with them, you know, even now that the, the fellowship is over. Um, the other two projects were two smaller uh, community organizations that were producing knowledge artifacts, guides, and courses, and those were more straightforward. Um, what does open licensing mean, and how might open licensing help us to share um, the work that we do? And, and you can find further detail in the report. Um, one lovely story, which I'll share with you all, which is the no, none of these people involved in any of these projects had ever heard of open education or open licensing or creative commons before. And the two women who I worked with in Green Sod, Ireland, were just, you know, totally inspiring people who are really trying to um, get the word out about, you know, ecology and biodiversity uh, in Ireland to children, to, to older students and to adults. Um, and they knew that copyright meant that they couldn't share their things. So they said to me in one of our first meetings, they said, well, yeah, we know that we, we don't really like copyright because it means we can't share it. So we just call it copyleft. <laughs> um, and they didn't know that there was such a thing as a copyleft movement or anything like that, free software, open software, nothing. Um, but being able to work with people who are were completely unencumbered by all the terminology and the jargon that we use and really just talk about you know, what they do, what's important to them, what's important to their communities and how they could share it. Um, I, I would say I probably got a lot more out of the project than um, the three partners, and I am happy to say that I'll, I will continue to work with them. So I have, um, you know, the GoGN team to thank um, for that, and happy to chat more in the in the roundtable. Thank you very much, Catherine. And now, Michael. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Nice to see so many here today. I hope you're doing well. Um, tell you a little bit about my project. There's so many synergies <laughs> between Vivian, Catherine, and my my project, um, and uh, it kind of see was started from my own reflection on thinking about how to support uh, future teachers with um, getting started with open education. I I worked, I had a bit of a career shift where I, for many years, worked in higher education, working with faculty. 
um, sharing the idea of open ed and getting into thinking about different types of open pedagogical approaches to teaching as, as well as open scholarship and other things. Um, but I recently, well, not so recently, but it feels recently <laughs> took a new role where I'm working um, in teacher education. So I work largely with um, people who are studying to be teachers and some early career teachers who are um, coming back for master's programs. So it's a different context that I kind of noticed it requires a little bit of a different approach, um, largely with future uh, K-12 teachers, the, the program and all the things they're learning are very overwhelming. So um, getting, and many of them don't come with an interest in technology, they're interested in teaching and um, working with young people. So um, trying to find a bridge to um, look at the core principles of open education, which I think align really well with the ideas of teaching in general, you know, compassion, inclusiveness, um, and accessibility, all those things that um, they'll talk about in our program, but they haven't actually made the connection to how can you make or use technology to enact some of those principles. So a bit of a journey thinking through that and decided that um, it was probably really important. And I, I have been trying to introduce open education in the, the course I teach that's a technology integration course. Um, a lot of them are interested in the tools and how do I use Kahoot and some of the interactive tools, but um, there's questions I'd like for them to be thinking about before they even get to that stage uh, that I think we can pull through from um, the wisdom of the open education space. So um, my project involved doing a study or a, 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 a survey where I where I, I put out a broad call to open educators to, you know, basically identify the core principles that they would tell any new teacher um, who was on a journey to becoming uh, a great teacher and maybe starting to think about how open education is part of that practice. And um, I think we have to do this, as the slide says, with a lot of care <laughs> and um, and be really mindful of um, you know what what um, what can support them best, especially in those early years. So obviously, uh, one of the great things would be sourcing um, open educational resources for developing their repertoires in the classroom, um, and then thinking about how they select technology and how they um, choose technology. So I kind of structured it around um, the, those technological values. What's important to think about when picking technology that would follow up and align with open education, um, what would be important when thinking about pedagogy, um, and then what would be important when thinking about the content or developing curriculum. And I didn't get as many responses um, to the survey. Surveys are always tough, one of the main, main learnings from this uh, um, project, but the responses I got were really thoughtful. Um, I think it struck a chord with some people thinking about, um, you know, K-12 and open education. There's lots of room for development there. There's lots of great things happening. Um, you know, Vivian is looking at K-12 teachers in practice. Uh, Viv Virginia did work um, on her um, uh, fellowship as well in, in K-12. And there's lots of scholars that are, are starting to have these discussions too. So collecting some of that now through a literature review and hopefully um, this will um, be shared eventually as, as a bit of a framework for thinking about open ed with new and emerging teachers uh, situated in the literature and then informed a little bit by the, um, the, the literature that I've had a chance to review. And I'm looking for allies who work in <laughs> K to 12. So if you know or are involved yourself, I'd be happy to chat. And um, yeah, I think I'll leave it there. We have to approach uh, open ed in K-12 with care and um, be sensitive to all the uh, overwhelm that many of them are facing and try to give them the right tools to move forward in an open way. Thank you, Michael. Okay, great summaries and introduction of your fellowships. And now we are gonna have a conversation together. Uh, I would like to know if you could identify at least one thing uh, or what would be the most important thing you have learned from the fellowship 
I'm launching this question to Vivian first. Me? Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, I, I think the most important thing that I learned from my fellowship is um, something I mentioned in my report. Well, first of all, it, it was very challenging. I mean, we had very little time, right, to, to, to plan everything, uh, to recruit participants, um, you know, to, to plan your whole research design, uh, to get the right answers, um, you know, and have them answered. And so it, it, it was like me, it felt like, you know, a mini marathon, <laughs> my doctoral dissertation, trying to get it right. And so one important thing I learned is, uh, is to keep things simple, you know, when it comes to uh, trying to do your fellowship, because if you start going to too many theories and all that, I knew I was going to lose myself. And then I was, I, was, I was bound to make things more complicated than they were. So I tried to, to really keep it simple uh, because I made that mistake with the doctoral dissertation and I ended up having to rewrite the whole thing. So um, I think that for me was um, like a major learning point, okay? That these fellowships are very good. In my case, uh, it did help uh, support my doctoral dissertation, some of the data I had collected there. Um, but I think I kind of focus on, let me keep this simple, short, straightforward, so that I can get the work done and get good results at the same time. So that for me was a major takeaway. Great. What do you think, Michael? Yeah, it's it's uh, it's quite an exercise in planning, in addition to whatever you already have going on in your life. Um, but it also is great to keep you moving forward and um, structuring the outputs through blog posts, documents, the process. So I've found myself even looking back at those or little, you know, basic their research notes to oneself to see where you were at at that time. So I, uh, in the in the transition to my new career, I've been trying to continue to um, you know share the research I'm doing and document uh, through blogging and stuff like that, but it's been hard. So um, gave me a real focus on intentionality towards that, and um, I'm hoping that I can build that in as a, a repertoire of my own wet for new projects. It's so often all the stuff, those early thoughts are just hidden in the REB or documents on your hard drive, and um, so I'm really hopeful because because uh i guess the to answer your question um directly the biggest um learnings from this were how much the project was enhanced by the feedback i received along the way and the feedback that was um structured into the fellowship through um you know sharing as we went but through the blog posts and I connected with a lot of people i might not have had to and heard from heard some really valuable feedback early on that really shaped the direction I went next. That was great. Thanks, Michael. Anything to add on that, Catherine? Um, uh, yeah, that's really interesting. I, I actually agree with both of you there. I uh, can relate, uh, Vivian and Michael. Um, mine, I think, is slightly different. My fellowship came just when I transitioned from working you know, within a formal HE organization to working independently. So it helped me to just disentangle open education from, you know, the whole structures of higher education and see how it applies just on a human level. So, you know, I, it was something I had to learn in a few weeks when I was first meeting with the partners, all the language that we use, I had to leave it at the door and just say, you know, what are you sharing with people? Who do you share with? Would you like to share with anybody else? Is there anything sensitive about, you know, what you should just really speak English and then really realizing that the simple tools like open licensing are not well known, you know, beyond education systems. And they're so valuable to people. I mean, I've gotten, you know, such great feedback from, from the, the partners who really are on their way now, you know, they're, they're, they're producing, they're applying what we did for specific guides and courses to to their work going into the future so I just see a lot of potential for engaging you know in in local communities 
um, with the work that we do and that it can make a real difference. All right, thank you. Yes, thinking about your answers, uh, something we have to realize is uh, how much time takes to uh, build relationships and and contact other people in terms of uh, research and actually any other thing as well. But it's uh, it's sometimes difficult to estimate the amount of effort for that and how uh, welcome and needed feedback is and, and getting those conversations. Um, now I would like to know about how much uh, the original fellowship changed and, and that process in this uh, about six months you had. Uh, Michael? Just to confirm the questions, how the how the initial idea changed? Yes, how your proposal has changed and evolved. Oh, oh, quite a bit. Um, yeah, from the early days, we did a webinar much like this, where we had a chance to share um, the basically the proposal we submitted. Um, and then there was so much feedback there, just around language. And, and that's getting back to Catherine's thought there. The language we use is so important um, in setting things up um, as well um as communicating the values of open ed to others uh and so it's, it's similar i think catherine with my group because they're teachers i've done research with them on awareness of open ed open access open scholarship there's not much they know the words but they, they don't know the um the kind of what it means for practice in um teaching and learning so uh that was really important uh and it just kept shifting uh as i went um, I adjusted um, the language I was using in the questions for the survey um, early on from that feedback. Uh, I connected with some folks on Twitter um, who were like, oh, this sounds interesting. I had a couple conversations. So even outside of the network, because it was open, uh, open research and openly shared uh, throughout the journey, I, I had some outside feedback as well as feedback from the uh, the GoGN core team. So so many opportunities for feedback. And as I said before, you're doing research. Sometimes you don't have a chance for that. You get your blinders on. And so um, that was really helpful to put things out there early. And um, yeah, it's been a, a really rewarding journey. And I know if I ever do share this in a very official way, there'll be lots of acknowledgements. So I got to keep track of all that now um, because so many people shaped and contributed to the, the, the trajectory of it. All about the learning process. Thank you, Michael. Uh, what do you think, Catherine? Can you come back to me, please? <laughs> yes, sir. Beep. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, I, I, I kind of agree wholeheartedly with what Michael just said now. Uh, you know, when we think, when we go back to the work we've done, we always think there's always room for improvement. So would I have done it the same way? No, maybe I would have done it a different way. Uh, but, you know, it's like you have one shot at it. So then you can't keep yourself, you know, like guilty and accountable. Well, why didn't I do it like this? Or why didn't I do it like that? So I think in the end, um, it was, we, I received really good feedback from both Michael and uh, Catherine and from you. You helped me a lot during this journey too. All the doubts I had. So that, that is really invaluable. Um, I would like to get this published. I think it's important work. Uh, no study like this has, has been done here in Brazil. So uh, I can, that will allow me, I haven't had time yet. I've been talking about this. I know since I finished it, but I haven't had time to get to that yet. Uh, but I think that that will give me an opportunity um, to kind of gauge what is the impact of this study, you know, in, in a bigger sense, in a broader sense of, of Brazilian public education as a whole during the COVID pandemic. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to doing that. Um, I will at some point. I don't know if it's going to happen this year. This has been a very hectic year. A uh, very difficult year, but um, I think that's what I have to say. I think you can always do things better, um, but also if you keep going back and saying, "Oh, you know, I could have done this or that," it's like you're not helpful. It's I think each of us did our best, and we had that. And I really thank you know the support I had from all of you very much. 
Thank you. Uh, Catherine, are you okay? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, um, I'll just add really briefly that uh, as much as um, I and we have talked about, you know, moving outside higher education and even the language of higher education to be able to knock on the door of, you know, these different community organizations that I worked with, you know, saying that um, this was under the auspices of this fellowship was really important. So, um, you know, I could have knocked on these doors and 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 made the same, um, you know, start tried to start the same conversations, but you know, having it be under the auspices of the fellowship, having your support and the support of, of the other fellows, really, I mean, that's supercharged it. I don't think I would have been able to do it, you know, certainly in a short period of time. So I know there's some past fellows here also, but if there are any potential future fellows, <laughs> um, I would highly encourage you to consider doing it. I think you can just see from the diversity of our projects, you know, any idea that you have, you know, can be supercharged. Um, by doing it, you know, as as a fellowship, as a Goji fellowship. Thank you very much. That's that's amazing. Um, now I would like to know. Um, I'm gonna combine this question actually. Uh, just let me know what did you enjoy the most, but as well what you found more difficult during the fellowship. What was more challenging during this time? I, I think I already said about the time constraint, but uh, yeah, let's let's discuss it together. Uh, Vivian, what do you think about that question? Well, definitely, Paco. I think time constraints uh, were the most challenging parts. Uh, and this also impacted how many uh, volunteers I was able to get. Uh, I, I always think that if I had had more time, I would have got, I maybe would have gotten at least two more, three more participants on board. And so I kept like, you know, trying to run after these guys and saying, please participate, please participate. This is important research. And so definitely uh, that, that, that was, I think, one of the main challenges of this um, fellowship. Uh, but as a whole, I think in answer to your second question, there was um, the first was what was more challenging and then what was more satisfying, right? Uh, I think what was more satisfying is that uh, you know, despite the fact that I wasn't able to get enough participants, at least the participants that I was able to get, uh, they did provide me uh, with very good data. And they did provide me with um, lots of feedback and, and, and lots of things. Uh, so, okay, it's a, it's a very small sample group. It's probably insignificant and all that. I acknowledge all that, but um, it, it made me happy to hear that there are teachers, uh, there are public teachers um, uh, here in Brazil that are that are starting to become aware. Uh, let's speak in, in simple English, okay? Uh, of, of, of these open resources, you know? And, and I really like what, what Catherine said about this metaphor of having to tell people, explain to people in English, you know? We have all this technical jargon and we cannot expect, you know, the broader audience and even teachers, right, to understand what this this whole thing is. So I think if we if we have that in mind, uh, it'll it'll be more satisfying. And I saw myself several times interviewing these teachers and talking to them in a vet and not in English but in Portuguese, and so <laughs> you know, explaining to them in simple Portuguese, you know, what it was that I was looking for, and so on and so forth. So thank you for that question, Paco. Thank you very much, uh, Michael. Um, I would say, you know, I had a really rich experience with the GoGN when I was in my PhD program, like so rich, so important, so many great conversations, connections and experiences. And then when you graduate, you're kind of adrift. <laughs> and so I've been seeking like, how do I stay connected? Um, if, how do I stay connected to this network? You know, I, I'm still on the list. I'm checking in on webinars, not as many live ones, but lots of the videos and checking the hashtag. And um, but the fellowship was such a great opportunity to really um, get an intentional connection to the network, and and that's been really, um, really, really valuable. 
uh, I'd love to find ways to keep uh, engaging in whatever way you know makes sense um, as going as we go forward, um, even beyond the fellowship. So it's a it was it gave me a chance to come back. I felt like it was a like a, a homecoming or a reunion in a way because um, it had been a couple of years since I had seen folks in person. I guess there was that pandemic thing too um, that <laughs> disrupted all of our um, abilities to connect. But um, that was the best part, certainly. And um, in terms of challenges, um, just finding this, finding space for this in the whole ecosystem of things going on. So that's time. I know that's not, that's the, the default answer, but um, it was challenging. Um, and then I guess, because we're all doing our research in local contexts, um, trying to put that all back together for a global to, to to create that global message around open ed can be tra challenging as well um, to get those contextual factors communicated. But that's where I guess the research and writing become part of um, the the work we have to do. Um, I, I agree with that, Michael. That's very strongly. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, I, I will add to that, just mine, again, is maybe slightly different, but um, for me, being able to connect, you know, work, the work I did in my PhD, the work that's been really meaningful for me for a long time with um, groups that are engaged in activism, which is another important part of my life, and kind of to put those two things together was, that was really the most enjoyable part for me. So, you know, I'm thinking again, just of another, of a conversation with one of the groups that started as a protest group and then became a constructive group around biodiversity and ecology and so on. And when they were describing to me how they made that transition from protest to a creative group um, by saying to themselves, what would we do if we knew we couldn't fail? they were just tired of protesting at negative things going on all the time. So here I was talking about, you know, open education and open licensing, all of these things with people who are really genuinely working, you know, mostly on a voluntary basis, you know, to improve the very local, you know, worlds that they live in. So again, um, it, it has just shifted things for me. It's, it's created, you know, relationships that I'm taking into the future. So that that was the most rewarding thing for me and it came at a good time so and I think this could also apply even if you are continuing to work in AT um, but um, but for me it was it was especially significant that's great thank you uh, yeah listening to your your answers it, it's very relevant the the social aspect and I think probably the pandemic has been quite influential as well and and the fact that, uh, as Michael said, many of the fellowship proposals ended up being quite uh, local and, and giving and bringing different views, which, uh, but actually they share a lot and, and help to, to bring that uh, global perspective. I think that's, that's really very, really, very relevant. And uh, something uh, important as well is like, okay, uh, Goji and alumni, how to keep them connected in the network and having the opportunity to have you um, here doing your research and, and your voice to, to the community, I think is, is something very relevant from, from the fellowships. I now would like to open the floor to uh, actually anyone who wants to, uh, uh, to talk, but particularly I would like to say hello to Chrissy and Judith who are as well fellows and are present in, in here. Would you like to show up and say hello? Hello everybody, good to see you and lovely to hear about the latest uh, three projects, always wonderful and uh, inventive, I think how you manage, how we all manage, I guess, to come back to GoGN and how we can't without it. <laughs> see, Judith, I think you were having some audio problems, so no worries. I, I guess my, my next question would be, and I think uh, because, yeah, thinking about the future, thinking about potential ne next GoGM phases, uh, what did you say to, to the GoGM members and alumni uh, about applying for a future uh, similar fellowship scheme? Would you encourage them to do so? Uh, I don't want to point anyone, feel free to, to answer. 
I'll answer. Uh, I, I would strongly advise uh, any GoGen member to, to, strong, to apply for a fellowship. It's, it's really well worth it. Um, you know, if I could do another fellowship again, I certainly would, Paco, because I cannot think of my life really without being involved in the GoGen network. I have been through such, you know, awesome experiences. Um, I have learned so much from the network. The network has given me so much. Um, and I think I've given the network back as well, but it, it is so, you know, it's so satisfying to be part of this global network. Um, me being a representative of Brazil, the only one, uh, uh, with all of these terrific people from all over the world. I think we learn and share so much from each other. So I absolutely would recommend any person coming into the network now. Yes, consider doing this fellowship. Yes, it's not easy. Yes, it, you know, it, but it's the tough things that I think make us move in the end, uh, not the easy things. And so I definitely would advise anybody who has any doubts should I do this fellowship? Yeah, apply for it. Go for it. Thank you, Bip. Uh, I know Catherine already said about that, but uh, do you want to add something on top? They are fine. Michael? Similar, uh, highly encourage the experience. Um, know that whatever idea you start with, it's going to change. Um, but it, it's actually going to change with the support of a great team of people who are really passionate about giving feedback. So that's a good thing. It, was, it can be a little scary, but um, it is uh, fantastic and a great, great, great thing to be a part of. Um, it's not your doctoral supervisor. It's uh, <laughs> your colleagues and um, that 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 makes a big difference. So um, if you're 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 willing to be open to that uh, almost like a metamorphosis of your research as you go, then you can really um, it's not only I think it's it's clear from what's been said here today. It's it's not like we're celebrating the output, we're celebrating the process, right? So um, that it's that is the really rich, rich part of this. Very, very appreciated. Um, just as a kind of follow up to that, um, is there anything that we could do differently that would help? Or, you know, is it kind of more hand holding, less, less hand holding, you know, support from a distance or more kind of shaping it up close? Uh, how do people feel about it? Obviously, every, every project is different and people are different, but. Rob, as far as I'm concerned, I mean, there's nothing that you could have done differently that would have made the process easier um, or better. I think I've, I felt fully supported by GoGen during the whole process. I felt 100% supported by the other fellows or, you know, or, or the former fellows as well. Um, and so I knew everybody would be there. To, to help out. And as Martin says, we're not, we're not as scared as a supervisor. No, we're not. And I think it's good, it's really good to know that you know you'll get really genuine feedback. So I don't really have any suggestion that I can make say, oh, you should have done this differently than you did. I think you know you guys are fabulous at planning things out and they work out. And and I guess it's up to us also to make them work. So Thank you. I have no further suggestions. Yes, you must complete your PhD. Yes. That, that, that is crazy. Yes, I totally agree with you, Chris. Yeah, you cannot do this before you complete your PhD. Uh, I think it's impossible for you to do this kind of thing if you haven't already had some experience with research uh, beforehand. It's going to be very difficult. Thank I you, wouldn't Rob. add. I, I wouldn't add anything, Rob. I think the the team has been super supportive. The communication has just been just right. I mean, we need a little time to muddle and then hear from you about a deliverable, and the, it's all been clear in terms of what's expected from the outset, and then guided along the way. So, I think it's a good model, um, and I think that I certainly felt supported and 
connected. Um, and so that really helped. Thank you. <laughs> and, and also, if I may add one thing, um, which is not about the GoGen network or about your support, uh, but I think about the expectations that um, the members have when they apply to the fellowship. You know, I was in doubt for a while, um, kind of reluctant because I thought, do I have anything to add? And if I do, I knew I did, but I, I said, how feasible is this, you know? And so I kept like postponing uh, because I thought I just wasn't ready um, or I was too involved in, in, in other works and, and so on and so forth. And I thought, I'm not gonna have time to dedicate myself to this. So I think it also has to be at a time when you feel that you really have something to contribute. And, um, and you also have the time and energy and the effort to put into it. So. That's great, thank you, because indeed it's been a learning process for all of us. Uh, so we launched the program, but uh, we have realized that maybe having uh, fixed calls wasn't useful for everyone. So we are thinking about more agile approaches and yeah, thinking how to support uh, people who are at different stages in their career. Um, um, uh, anyone, uh, yeah, Rob, please. I was just gonna say, I think, um... Projects come in all different shapes and sizes as well. And, you know, we have to impose a kind of standardization on it and say, well, we think we think the project would be about this long and deliver this kind of thing. But there is potential, for, especially with, a, with an agile approach, there's potential to go, someone says, actually, look, I've got this thing that I could do. There's a critical time period for me to do it in the next three months. How about this? You know, and maybe we'd be in a position to support that rather than this is now the kind of, you know, after you do your PhD, now you do this thing next, and there's a sort of sequence to it. It can be a bit more, you know, um, organic, I suppose. So we have five fellows today here. Anyone wants to make any further question? Thinking about a fellowship. Yes, uh, uh, can I say hi to everyone? Of course. Um, yeah, it's very nice to be here. I really want to congratulate the three the three uh, uh, fellows who have shared their wonderful experiences. And ideally, as a, as a fellow, I really recommend this to anyone who has completed a PhD. It's a very good jump. I would call it a jump start because it gives you a different view of things. Immediately after you are done with the supervisors, you are done with the paper. And so uh, the fellowship itself is it, it, it's just a wonderful thing to give a try. Please let us. Do, uh, give give support to this initiative. Let us also ensure that we encourage others who are undertaking their, I mean, their PhDs uh, and on OEP, OEP to join this network called the GoGN. I keep asking this question all the time. How do people finalize or finish their PhDs without joining GoGN? Please let us join GoGN. It's a very good initiative and it gives you all that you need of your supervisors and you get advices from people who are expertise and love is within GoGN for you to accomplish your PhD. Thank you and hi to everyone. Well, I guess uh, unless any further comment, we can move to the next uh, part of the, of the session in which we are gonna be launching the report. Remember how to share a screen. So, hurrah! We are launching the report. Uh, it's available already in uh, the link we are going to be sharing now in the chat. Project outputs, and uh, it basically tries to summarize the idea of the fellowship scheme. Uh, the first part of it tries to contextualize uh, where it's coming from and the main concepts. Then there is introduction to each of the nine fellows in their own words, what was the original proposal? So it's possible to see as well the evolution of it and consider that roadmap that's been followed by all the fellows and, and ourselves. 
Uh, the most important part is the Gaudian Fellows Experiences and Reflections, which contains uh, all the reports that the fellows sent at the end of the fellowship. So basically it's uh, about 2000 words for each of the fellows summarizing their experience, what did work, what didn't work, how they learned through the process. And the last bit is uh, uh, about um, reflections of the fellowship scheme, considering all those moments in which we are sharing uh, ideas with fellows, uh, that uh, service we had at the midterm final of the fellowship, and as well the nine interviews here as well, uh, launching today. So just very briefly, and thanks to this uh, marvelous Brian's uh, um, um, scheme. So uh, it's been already uh, two years since we started in uh, 2020. Uh, with the core, with four fellows, we didn't know what uh, was going to look like, and uh, having as well uh, presentations of fellows at the beginning of each core has been indicated as something useful, so they could present uh, in a Goji and webinar such as this one, their research uh, within the community, but as well had the opportunity to present at the conference venue. Uh, unfortunately, at the time, it was uh, mostly online, and it's been the uh, through the process uh, of the scheme uh, online until until the end. Uh, so uh, then we had the second court with only two fellows, but again, uh, third court with three and kind of covers the expectations we had to get nine uh, fellows when we started. So just very briefly, I'm thinking about in even a uh, conversation we had today uh, uh, about the support so uh, uh, even one of the main constraints, and we have noted that it was the six months uh, and having calls where people might not feel confident at that time to submit something. Uh, there was flexibility. So yeah, we came with an original idea of how the scheme had to look like, but uh, then we realized that discussing with uh, uh, the GoGN alumni uh, that uh, other ideas could be uh, supported by GoGN and uh, as well, that idea of being supported as an open educational researcher and, and the conversations within GoGN and, uh, and all the common team and having that critical feedback uh, through the webinars or with the team conversation uh, was handy. What about thinking uh, in the future in case uh, I want to be there and thinking about uh, future possible uh, potential schemes? Um, so yeah, the idea is that uh, Keep that uh, open uh, idea, keeping that that uh, we can be reached at any point and have conversations, and as well um, the opportunity to have that view and uh, bring something innovative, something that might be linked with your PhD, might be not. Uh, you are not uh, strained by uh, uh, rigid rules. You can bring your own idea. It can be something in exploratory. And, and something you might benefit in the future uh, of doing so and being passionate about. So thank you all fellows. Now we have available all the interviews. Uh, they are um, in our uh, YouTube channel. Uh, we have a list uh, we are sharing as well. We are gonna be promoting these interviews during the next weeks uh, with all fellows. Thank you again for taking your time and discussing with us and getting feedback about your experience and how to improve. And now we are going to be uh, watching one uh, video prepared by uh, Beck. Uh, I'm going to be sharing it from uh, directly from YouTube. Hope it works with the sound. And it's about uh, reflections on the impact of the Goji and fellowships. We are aware nine fellows couldn't be here. There's a time difference. Those in Australia is quite a bad timing. Uh, so there we go. It's really been fabulous because it's given me a lot more practice of talking about what I do. Like what, you know, we were, we were always encouraged to get our elevator pitch together and 
you know, through the through the fellowship, uh, the ability to gather all that evidence from students and work with students um, to to keep reshaping uh, the unit that we were teaching them. Um, but you know, the ability to keep centering student voices and to make that part of an open practice. I think that's helped me articulate the value of that a lot. It just uh, gave me hope in a really difficult time. Um, my role was made redundant and I was really unsure how I could keep making a contribution in this space and how I could keep the attention on this sort of social justice opportunities that open education has beyond, you know, the kind of access for everyone argument. So yeah, this piece came at a time that just gave me um, a bit of hope and a little bit of um, meaning and focus uh, to get to the point where now I do feel that I have a nice balance between um, research collaboration work and um, doing some practical work for equity and inclusion. And actually at the moment RMIT is developing an open scholarship policy and I've been on the steering committee for that. So, you know, that wouldn't have happened without the research. The fact that uh, I'm holding a regional office uh, and uh, uh, this is the hub for Africa uh, that currently has five, five countries in it. And of course the global program is run in 27 countries. And that means that uh, my profile has gone up, not just because of the fellowship, but because of the network in general. Because uh, when people hear about this university in the UK, the Hewlett Flora Foundation funding this fellowship, they're like, okay, this is the person because all this reads in my CV. So as a person, this has really given me a notch higher, has raised my profile. But what everybody said who was involved uh, in, the, uh, pro in, in the creation of the picture book said that was an oasis of happiness, if you like, and, and co-creation that they welcomed during these uh, difficult times. Um, so through this inquiry, because it was an inquiry to create um, a, the collaborative picture book, I, I feel that I learned a lot and it created a new, uh, new areas for exploration. Uh, but I think there will be uh, an excellent impact in the mid to long term future. Um, and, and it's quite an honor. Uh, you know, to have received the fellowship from GoGen because I know the selection process is very tough. So I think as soon as I start disseminating um, my research, I think um, there will be an excellent impact. But this was going into community organizations as an open education professional and open education researcher. And, you know, to be able to go in under the auspices of, you know, GoGen fellow um, funded by the Open University and Hewlett, you know, just brought a bit of um, understanding about, you know, what I was bringing with me. You know, I, I was able to go in in the very first meetings with these organizations and say, yes, I'm Catherine Cronin and I'm an open education professional and I'd like to help you. But, you know, as a GoGN fellow, um, I'm going to share the work that we're doing together with this global network um, of open education researchers. Um, they may have ideas and they may know of other work similar to what you're doing here. Um, and I'll bring that back to you and that'll help us solve, you know, the problems that we're addressing. Um, uh, and also, uh, you know, people will very, un you know, people will find out about the good work that you're doing. So that could help you to develop relationships. The fellowship has helped tremendously in that it's given me um, a connection to a global organization where uh, it's, it's a reputable organization in the open education world, perhaps I would argue maybe one of the most um, in terms of research in open education. Um, so that looks fantastic um, as part of my CV that gets uh, reviewed regularly. And um, the research itself should result in a publication, which would will also be fantastic. Um, I've had some opportunities for service through sharing the ideas and um, sharing them the research at uh, a couple conferences and it will impact my teaching so it, it, it's impacted my research my service and my teaching so in terms of um, my own development in this role it's been a huge uh, benefit 
I actually used all of the open educational resources in my current job, um, and we used it as a pilot to figure out how do we um, collect um, different types of, of digital artifacts. So we had the blogs, we had the podcasts, we had different types of, uh, of, as I say, digital files, and then we collected them and we put them into this new um, library project that we're working on to create repository at our university. So that really benefited me in my job because I was able to um, discuss that. Well, um, I would like to take advantage of this interview to share how good uh, this experience has been for me for many reasons. Uh, first of all, I hope that, that the study developed under the Gaussian Research Fellowship make make a contribution to understanding of the phenomenon as well as to making recommendations that can guide policy and practice in open education in Uruguay. And I think I think it was very important for me to also to, to see the application of uh, the conceptual model I developed in my PhD thesis and applied in another educational context and in an emergency situation. Um, so I think this, this experience has allowed me to mature my capacity as researcher in open education. Uh, I was invited in, 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 in some uh, um, uh, events in, in, in the, in the organized by the administration of public education in Uruguay to, to talk about that. Uh, I believe that also the, the greatest work will be in the possibilities to spread these results among the, the stakeholders. Um, disseminating the findings was one of the, the first actions of the NESCO chair, I told about that, and I shared among teachers, education authorities, and other stakeholders. Thank you very much, and before we come back to uh, finalize and, and further questions, uh, please, a reminder again to fill in the annual survey. It's very important for us to get feedback. And we can already announce uh, Rockstar Ban. We are going to be launching the annual report. It's at the date. It's going to happen the 20th of December at uh, 4 UK time. Now I stop sharing. Well, again, thank you very much uh, to all of you for uh, being here with us today. Thank you, particularly Michael, Viviana, and Catherine. And knowing Catherine, you're not feeling that well. Um, I would like to share the links with you. Sorry, I haven't been keeping an eye in there. Paco, while you are doing that, we just have to say you are just the hub of all these communications. And thank you so much. I mean, I know this, I, I applaud the entire team behind this, but you've been amazing in terms of communicating, following up and everything. Um, and we really appreciate it. Thanks. Yeah, I, I would also like to um, thank you, Paco. Uh, and thank you back, who is not here, but for your help and support throughout this process. Um, really couldn't have done it without you. You've been amazing and really, you know, extending your hand and giving us a helping hand especially in my case. Thank you very much for this opportunity and thank you for all your hard work as well. Thank you very much, all of you. I think I now have shared all the links. And uh, okay, uh, I think we can uh, close the session now and uh, we keep in touch. So remember, next uh, webinar is going to be uh, next month to launch the uh, annual review and celebrations for uh, festivities. Thank you very much, all of you. Take care. Thanks, Paco. Thanks, everyone. I'll, um, I'll just stop the recording now.